Hi, everyone. Happy Thursday. Um, thank you for joining us today. It's good to be here discussing the learnings and reflection from our Validation Hub case studies. I'm Maya from Procagia, and I'll be hosting the webinar today. A little bit about me, Procagia engages extensively with our consortium. So uh, I get some fun time set aside to volunteer and help out with our consortium and our adoption series specifically while I work full-time at Procagia. Um, we're heavily involved in the R community and we're a data science consulting firm that's based in all over, but uh, primarily in the US and in Canada. And we help out companies on projects on all things related to data. Um, but more specifically, we're, we really enjoy promoting R, uh, the adoption of R. Uh, very passionate about that. And I really love working here because I get to do cool things like this on uh, Thursday morning at 8 a.m. <laughs> Uh, volunteered for this though, so no complaints. Um, feel like please feel free to reach out to me to stay in touch if you want to get involved or join us. Um, it's something we're very passionate about. Um, the other part of this is um, I'm also interested in this on selfish reasons because very uh, fascinated by our validation. So I'm kind of like strapped in and ready to see this presentation just as the rest of you. Uh, the event is recorded. So you can always come back and refer to it if you missed any parts or if you had a meeting at 8.30 and had to leave. Um, I would like to go ahead and introduce our speakers and contributors, panelists, um, who will be helping out with the breakout rooms today after Julianne presents. Um, we'll also be uploading a PDF if uh, any of you haven't used Zoom breakout rooms before. It will have a simple instruction on how to use it and how to hop in and out of rooms. Introducing you to the main presenter, Julianne Manitz. Uh, she's a statistician in the pharmaceutical industry who currently works in the field of immuno-oncology at EMD Serrano in Massachusetts. In this role, she works on statistical methodology, innovation, and technology. She has contributed to various R packages and a member of the R Validation Hub Executive Committee, working on software validation for the usage in pharmaceutical trials. We also have other contributors who will help us out with the breakout rooms, Pritam. Pritam is a standards lead at Mark, providing leadership in de in to develop and maintain global standards for Atom implementation, our package development, open source, package qualification, computing platform enhancements, and compliance management tools. He's also a member of the R Validation Co uh, Hub Executive Committee. He actively promotes the use of open source software and clinical trial data analysis via platforms and paper publications. He has a PhD in bioengineering from Temple University. We also have Doug. Doug Kelkoff has been supporting the, R, the adoption of R in the pharmaceutical space for the past six years. During his time at Roche, he's pushed the adoption of R through pilot clinical trials showcasing the benefits of using R by crafting internal tools and building services that embed the R Validation Hub's guidance as a part of their software development cycle. He's passionate about making the use of open source tools in a, regulate, in a regulated setting as a viable path, not just in large pharmaceutical companies, but in lean startups and the public sector. He wants to do this by addressing challenges through open initiatives. Now we have Eric Millman from Biogen. He's a data scientist in the pharmaceutical industry who currently supports the adoption of R and other open source tools at Biogen. During his time at Biogen, he's pushed the adoption of R and open source tools by showcasing uh, internal tools for Biogen's analytics environment and software development lifecycle. He's contributed to various internal and external R packages, and he's also part of the R validation executive committee. He's currently the lead developer of the risk metric package, which is sponsored by the R Validation Hub. Uh, let's get started. I'll let Julianne take the, take the stage. Thank you. All right, let me do uh, the screen sharing. Yep. Um, I hope this works for you. Yes, if we can. Can I see it. your screen? This is a good time to yell at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, I'm 
obviously presenting on behalf of the Hub. Um, this is um, uh, a group of people and uh, uh, partly we presented here helping out with the breakout rooms. And uh, before we get started, actually, I have the honor to make a really good announcement because we have a little bit of a shift in leadership. Andy has been leading us uh, in a really beautiful way for the last couple of years. And um, um, he is stepping back and uh, Doug is stepping up. So Doug, do you want to uh, say just uh, one, two words? Uh... Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Julian, for letting me, you know, for announcing this and for letting me say a little something. Um, there's not a whole lot that I can add since my blurb was just read off, you know, seconds before. Um, but this is a good time to thank Andy for being our uh, forming leader and for really setting us up to have a, a bunch of success stories in the past few years. Um, I'm excited to be carrying that torch. And so, um, yeah, looking forward to seeing what, what comes. What that means for people in attendance is if you want to see things change in the way that we've been operating, now's the time to reach out because we, we you know we're going through a little transformation ourselves. And um, that allows us to kind of reflect on how we've been operating and if if you want to see anything happen differently, if you want to see more, more of these types of outreach activities, you know, now's the time to let us know. So thanks, Julianne. I'll hand it back over to you. Yeah, speaking about reflection. So this presentation <laughs> is a little bit of basically actually taking a step back and uh, seeing what the our validation hub has been doing over the years, but also reflecting on um, how the things were implemented in the different companies and I think um, it's a it's a fantastic opportunity to actually realize um, how much impact we could have in such a short amount of time and uh, also how how helpful we were maybe in like setting some guidances in one places and then maybe uh, opening uh, up other opportunities for further development um, for how how to improve the risk assessment for our packages in pharmaceutical industry. So having said that, um, that's a little bit of an outline, just keeping the recap. We are, uh, we are trying to re uh, recap like real quick, uh, just in case you haven't been too much in touch and like what this our validation hub is about in the first place, um, the white paper, and then actually going into the case studies because uh, there are quite a few uh, companies who have adopted it. And we had a, a comprehensive conversation around um, how that was implemented. And then um, it's uh, time to uh, stop leaning back and we want to have your opinion and actually have an active discussion uh, as active as possible in the breakout rooms. Um, so yeah, um, this is only for the first part a land reform folding kind of webinar. And then for the second part, um, please join us. Um, so in 2018, um, is this just so in 2018, um, there was a pharma and we basically started out with, um, it was time to integrate R into pharma. And the question at that time, it was actually a question, is it even possible? Is it a feasible thing to do? And um, a few very passionate people came together. And I think our pharma really helped out there to bring people together in, uh, in Harvard here in uh, Massachusetts. And um, it's uh, it was a wonderful venue and that was a really good kickoff to actually prove the point that it is not only possible it is actually um bringing a lot of new improvements so um just uh we 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 quick recap what is the our validation hub it was initially a psi aims special interest group and now it's also an uh, our consortium working group we have approximately 100 members and um uh, over 50 organizations and a mission. Um, so we started out in June 2018. Uh, we got that our consortium funding as well uh, to create that uh, online repository for our package validation. Um, yes, so um, sorry. Um, and our mission is to have a cross industry initiative uh, so that not everyone is doing their own thing and have some sort of alignment and to enable the use of our in the pharma, biopharmaceutical industry, not only in the big pharma companies, but also having um, the learnings from that into smaller companies as well. And basically um, having the on-ramping there and making it easier. So 
Um, having said that, there are a bunch of resources available. There's a website called pharma.org. Uh, on this website, it's worth uh, watching out for the white paper, for a blog posts. There has been other publication last fall. Um, presentations and various conferences, case studies, all these kind of things, um, recordings. We try to have that uh, as updated as possible and uh, publish uh, blog posts on a sort of regular basis. Um, but, you know, um, this is all theory, but for practice, there are actually also tools available, which is um, the risk metrics, risk metric package, and both are uh, GitHub. Uh, so I'm here to and Kran, and um, uh, Eric is leading that. Um, so he's here uh, as he's joining us. So that's great. And then the second uh, tool is actually a, a visual interface, a shiny app for the risk metric package, so that no programming uh, requirements are necessary. And that is led by Alan. Um, so this is how it looks like. It's actually very straightforward. It's just a very straightforward uh, way on how to use the risk metric package. So you have like just six by examples um, of different packages that they, they get into a package reference first um, and you collect that information. And as soon as you have that package table, basically you can do the assessment and uh, based on the assessment, you uh, can assign scoring and summarize the scores across the different metrics. So for the different packages, the six packages below each other here with the different versions, obviously every output will be version specific. Um, license might be available, might not be available, um, but that can be scraped. Um, then there are like some metrics like whether help is exported, vignettes are available, bug URL that would be GitHub and status um, is basically the uh, percentage of closing and whether there's news available. Just like some, you know, good maintenance metrics, meta information that can help to assess whether a package is like developed with a good software development cycle or not. So these two are supposed to, tools are supposed to support uh, an assessment um, rather than having to manually uh, go into each uh, of the packages description file whatsoever. And uh, just to have a look at the app, I think this is not how it looks anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry for not updating that screenshot, um, but um, sorry. Um, but in a nutshell, we have here the uh, package that uh, is selected, and you can just have a drop down menu. You can extend you can extend the package list and also the different versions. And uh, on then the lower part will be basically something that can be filled out by the user, and uh, there are different. Uh, there can be either an admin or user user. Um, uh, for this app and accordingly um, uh, you would have like the packages here is, for the example is un under review has a fairly low risk of 0.14 and then based on that the overall risk can be assigned manually and this decision and you could create a validation report uh, that could be used for the documentation. Um, yes, so this is basically already the result. And that result can be like informed by different maintenance metrics. Here we have vignettes, news, uh, source control and GitHub, yes, no. And uh, all these kind of um, maintenance metrics that may be more or less important for your decision-making to assess the risk. There are other things available like community usage. And, um, um, and here you also have a report preview and kind of there these things. So, just to let you know how this looks like, um, there is a lot of additional information available, as I said, on the website that guides you more specifically and more extensively uh, into how to use these tools. And um, the R validation hub is obviously not existing like in a, in a vacuum. There are a lot of partner initiatives that we want to highlight here, just a few of them. There is, for instance, the R table uh, for R tables group for regulatory submissions working group um, to create standard tables uh, that meet the requirements that are needed for FDA submission standards. Um, there has been the R submission pilot working group, which has been focusing on IT and platform uh, questions around to make a 
all our regulatory uh, submission and uh, just basically proving the point that it is possible. And uh, uh, I think, um, I mean, I personally think uh, so. Um, if you, if we can make an all our regulatory submission, that is actually also saying that it is very feasible to um, maybe do a mixed, a hybrid, or whatever is feasible for you. Um, then we have uh, partner initiatives, clinical statistical reporting in multilingual world, seeking to assess like uh, those subtle differences that may come up when using different programming languages uh, in pharma, uh, very typically between SAS and our other sort of open source languages. And then obviously our pharma kind of a little bit of a um, play, birthplace of the R validation hub sort of where um, uh, this group really initiated it, uh, in the first place. And it's an annual conference. It's a, we really recommend it. It's a lot of fun. And it's one of the few uh, conferences which really took off online and uh, just made it, very, made it really, uh, made it a fun way to join from home. All right, so. Um, so many resources, but what, how do we actually assess the risk? Um, so the white paper basically differentiates um, the between core packages, means base and recommended packages, uh, and contributed packages, and um, there are various arguments why we can assume there's minimal risk in the core R packages for regulatory analysis. Specifically, the R Foundation has provided a very ex ex extensive guidance document um, on uh, the regulatory compliance and validation issues. So it really goes into the details of their software development cycles. And uh, based on those details, um, the minimal risk uh, can be uh, recommended. So um, for the contributed packages, however, the out of um, parts, um, we are using them a lot. Um, there is a huge variety in quality, robustness, and um, uh, trustworthiness, right? So when we have a package on CRAN, we have some basic technical checks that are, gun, that, that are basically run, but it does not necessarily guarantee that a package is accurate, or the package out, the result is, uh, the, um, uh, result is accurate that you create. Um, so based on that, um, the R validation hub def defines a framework to assess the accuracy based on uh, multiple steps uh, intended to use. We are going into that on the next slide. So you basically have a new package. You ask your question whether you um, um, intend to use that package or if it is an indirect import. If it is an uh, indirect import, you can... Uh, yeah. Uh, the white paper recommends minimal checks for uh, suitability. Otherwise, if it is intended to use, uh, the risk assessment should kick off. Um, and there was um, the idea of differentiating between a statistical package and non-statistical package means uh, statistical packages having things that like actually like implement um, algorithms and specific calculations um, that basically um, result in the final hazard ratio being accurately derived, yes or no, versus uh, maybe less strong, um, uh, like we can accept a higher risk maybe for a package that does uh, data wrangling or plotting because these things are easier to just check visually, for instance. Um, then the pack, the another step of questioning could be um, whether a package is maintained, um, so this is like a lot of like, uh, um, like uh, things that you basically get out of the uh, description files. So do you have a good maintenance? Do you have a news file? Do you have, um, do you get quick results on GitHub? Kind of these things, um, and that can be obviously helping you um, to uh, understand how fast a bug, if there is discovered, one would be resolved, for instance. Um, another step with how much the package is used, because not only the testing in the background uh, may be of interest, but also the community usage is kind of an informal testing, even though the testing is not like directly implemented into the package. And then you come uh, to the final decision whether it meets the requirements you include it into the regulatory environment or you reject it. And at all these steps before you reject, 
you can always have uh, extra remediation and testing to actually come back and uh, uh, give it the opportunity to um, meet the requirements. So this is um, kind of the pipeline um, that was suggested in the white paper uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, last year, we had a three-part presentation series on case series and eight farming companies actually participated and we had like a call for participation. Eight car pharma companies came back and said like, yes, we would like to share how we are implementing this uh, in uh, the different experiences as well into in different GXP frameworks. And um, we were asking people to highlight what was easy to implement and what was more challenging. Um, and uh, the opportunity we, we, we thought it would be a great opportunity on the one hand to bring together to see what do what do what does do other people do what do other companies do but also to kind of um waterproof your own framework so if if you're if you're deciding as a company to make an all our submission at a certain point and that's the first time you're actually like exposing your framework to the outside there might be things be found uh, from someone from the outside that you haven't considered when you're developing uh, the framework. So this was a little bit of an opportunity to actually like expose the framework, expose it to discussion and get also some more input from other um, industry collaborators. And um, I think it went uh, really nicely. We have the recordings available on the our validation uh, hub minutes page here. So on pharma.org. And uh, there is also um, a little bit of discussion and uh, exchange in GitHub. And we obviously encourage uh, everyone to contribute. And if we have another group of people who want to update their framework and maybe we do another uh, part of or new companies who would be interested to show their concepts, <coughs> um, we would be obviously very happy to accommodate um, another episode. So um, for this uh, presentation, we want to uh, summarize uh, some common themes and some differences, but also some challenges and uh, where we maybe have further ideas. So for the common themes, um, I mean, we are, we the pipeline was suggested by the R validation hub and then we are calling for case studies. So it's maybe a little bit of a selection bias, but all case studies surprisingly use the risk-based uh, validation approach. So um, people who said that's something that we don't use at all for some reason didn't reach out to us. Um, so that could be a selection bias, but we say like yay. So there was a there was a large number of companies who actually implemented it as outlined uh, by the uh, white paper. There were different classification uh, of the package qualities, either in a three level high, medium, low, or a binary high, low categorization. Um, but uh, the assessment, how the different uh, companies got to this assessment varied um, um, in, in, in various settings. Um, um, there was in all approaches, there were uh, was a high importance of test coverage um, as an assessment metric and uh, for trusted resources. Um, so they are like different metrics were chosen and we'll get into that and the differences. But um, a common theme was that the test coverage was rated quite high as importance. And um, for trusted resources, um, so that's one part of the white paper that I didn't really touch on yet. So the white paper opens the opportunity to create, uh, classify certain, uh, um, how, let's say maintenance groups. Let's uh, understand the R consortium who produce core and base pack, the core packages, so the base and recommended packages as a trusted resource because they have been opening up their uh, software development cycles. And then a typical question would be, um, is our studio also a trusted resource? Um, because for some of their packages, they actually have done, is have created a similar, um, a similar document. Uh, also STAN developers have, for instance, have done that. Having said that, um, uh, that idea of creating trusted resources um, has been actually adopted. Um, so 
um, we have seen that um, the core packages based on recommended were treated as collective, as low risk. And uh, some organizations also trusted um, our studio developments like the Tidyverse and other packages. Um, and then another common theme that we have discovered is the majority of the uh, approaches focused on risk assessing the intended to use packages all, uh, only. And uh, because by the end of the day, you have your tests running on the upper, uh, on the highest level, and you can rely that you indirectly test the de dependency, the parts of the dependency that are well, that are relevant for you. Um, but yeah, a few companies also ran the metrics on the inputs just to be on the safe side. All right, coming to the differences in the approaches, there were various degrees of automation uh, in the risk qualification. And uh, um, so the, some packages were classified uh, almost automatically at low risk if, uh, with, if certain metrics were approved approving that, so uh, if certain metrics were fulfilled, uh, some of the packages were, uh, were automatically at low risk with uh, little or no human intervention. And uh, for higher risk packages, there were typically some sort of pathways to have additional human assessment so that packages are not being thrown out uh, without um, double checking first. Um, other companies, however, had, uh, were relying highly on human guided assessments throughout, which is a little bit more, um, <laughs> a little bit more, way more labor, labor intensive. Um, we also found that uh, there were different weights that were assigned to the test coverage and various suggested metadata metrics. So uh, for software development cycles, I have mentioned them before. And uh, the was not like a common threshold, um, but for is, uh, what kind of test coverage would be required um, to uh, create a low, to have a low risk package. But um, there was a range of like 50 to 80% minimum um, test coverage in order to, look, um, to rate a package as low risk. Um, and then different risk mediation strategies were applied. Some organizations immediately introduced their own unit tests. Others did restrict the package use only to a subset of the package functionalities. There were different interesting approaches. Um, uh, definitely um, the opportunity to learn from. And then some common challenges because um, having this adapted is one thing, but also where where is the where where is the pathway? Where, where do we continue next? Um, also, where can the, our validation hub actually help out in the future? Um, and we have identified some common themes, and these are actually the breakout rooms. So um, I hope you're almost almost done with recording the laundry now. Um, um, so these are the different challenges that we would like to discuss in the breakout rooms. Um, so the First thing is, um, so I'm just speaking first about the common challenges and then we speak about the breakout rooms. Um, so the common challenge, one piece of uh, common challenge is the time intensity of uh, the resource and time intensity of the package risk assessment. So R is for free, but it is not for free. That kind of uh, theme I think became pretty clear to everyone. And uh, buying a licensed uh, software and buying like, oh, someone has looked over that um, is something um, that we uh, that we kind of have to find better ways for our, and that's why we are doing this, right? So it can, can be really a considerable challenge to go through a large number of packages, especially when the versions have uh, uh, changed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at the same time, you gotta make sure that the reviewers of the R package actually do have the right technical expertise. Um, and uh, also you have a good set of different contributors from different areas because not every package can be assessed by everyone. So um, you wanna have uh, good contributors across your organization from IT, quality assurance, statistics, data science, programming lines, et cetera, et cetera. So you're, um, that is like 
who is doing the R package assessment and how much time should that person spend on? And that obviously depends on the, on the level on automation that a specific company is implementing. Another challenge was finding appropriate test data sets, test cases, and expected model outputs. And uh, that was a common challenge, and there, uh, that's definitely a topic in the breakout rooms. I happen to know that. And um, the another common challenge is the long-term management and maintenance, as well as the oversight of risk package uh, assessment pro uh, process, specifically for those uh, approaches that are highly dependent uh, to run things automatically. So what's a good timing to actually make sure that the decisions that are automatically taken are still the right ones uh, in a couple of years? Um, and how long are you gonna wait and things like that. So having said that, like these things are still in the little footsteps. And um, this would be, maybe before we go into breakout rooms, we maybe gonna have like, questions uh first and then book of breakout rooms what do you guys think um i'll jump in quickly so we, we we have a little bit of an audible to call in terms of how the breakout rooms are going to go so it turns out because we're set up today as a webinar and not a meeting we can't do breakout rooms so what okay. we're going to do instead is we're going to use the question and answer um style for people to contribute and we're going to go down the list of breakout room topics um, and we'll each present kind of a brief summary on the maybe some of the considerations that we would like input on or some of the topic areas that you might consider discussing um, we'd appreciate if you're in attendance if you um, have questions or thoughts on the topic this is kind of meant to be an open forum as much as it can be in the webinar style meeting um, so also if you'd like to chime in you're welcome to um you can raise your hand and um our hosts here will give you privileges so that you can uh, ask the question directly if you'd prefer that otherwise you're welcome to ask it in chat and we'll read it out um, as we go through so um if eric's ready maybe we'll go down the list and um, just kind of introduce <coughs> the topics sorry to put everyone on the spot to kind of uh, briefly do a summary of these these four different topics but are you ready eric uh, yeah. Cool. I'll um, hand it over thank to you. you. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm uh, one of the developers on the risk metric package and my compatriot, Aaron Clark, who is the lead developer on the risk assessment app. Um, we work sort of hand in hand to developing sort of a, you know, a suite to help with this initial risk assessment, uh, the um, sort of validation process. And one of the things that we have are aiming to figure out are how people in the, how users end up implementing um, sort of package scores, um, whether it's some sort of thresholding, maybe, you know, some, like we talked about, some people might classify packages as low, medium, high, or low, high, or accepted, rejected. Um, and specifically, like, maybe what those thresholds are or approximately what they might be. So is a score of 0 0.3 or lower high, or is it 0 0.5, sort of how those thresholds might be drawn. Um, and then also, um, I think if you're not aware, the risk assess risk metric package and app allow you to reweight individual uh, Patrick, uh, assessment scores um, to calculate that final risk score. And we're curious to know if users use this functionality and if so, how they might sort of reweight various assessments. Um, as Julianne mentioned, like test coverage um, is heavily relied on, um, you know, and so we're interested to know how much you might reweight something like that assessment. We actually have a survey um, made up for this. Um, it doesn't look like I can send it to the entire webinar, but maybe uh, Maya or Agueda could send it. I just dropped it in the, the panelist chat. Um, so I would welcome any, we would welcome any feedback in sort of how you maybe tune the scoring outputs for your um, organization or your use cases.
All right, maybe I can take over from there. I'm seeing a couple questions trickle in, um, but if you want, Eric, um, maybe I'll ask this one to you, but if you, it might pertain to everyone. Um, so there's a question about um, asking whether anyone's companies have or um, have put this into practice and whether their IT functions or quality assurance functions have been involved in reviewing the process that they've adopted. Um, is that something that you want to answer, Eric, or should we kind of collectively answer that um, after we've all introduced the topics? Uh, I, I can give at least my experience at Biogen, and then if others want to chime in. So we have presented this to our IT and IT quality organizations um, and gotten their buy-in, um, but we have at Biogen kept the process in the business. So we got them to understand like how packages work and how it's not really software so that they don't necessarily need to worry about as much, but here's our process to make sure we're, you know, doing things right. Um, and, and that seems to work well, reduces overhead on their part and increases sort of response time on uh, for the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the same happened uh, uh, in our part of the company as well, EMD Solana. And just kind of reflecting on the case study discussions, I feel like that was a little bit of a common theme is that a lot of the process that people adopted started with the white paper that the R Validation Hub put out and then a conversation with their quality assurance or IT folks um, to kind of see what that middle ground looked like and who should own the, the process. And um, it sounds like then from there, a common theme seems to be the business takes over the actual evaluation part. And I can speak for on, on Roche's behalf to say that that's also kind of how we have adopt have that that's what our trajectory looked like as well. So yeah, at Merck, I mean, sorry, Doug, I had answered the question directly in the chat, but yeah, at Merck, we made sure that when we are doing the package qualification process, we had the buy-in from IT and uh, quality, uh, QA teams all the way through. And it's an active process. We keep on um, going through them for different changes. And at Merck, uh, IT is actually, a ha um, you know, we are actually both partners because everything we develop, um, they also are part of it because we made sure that we are the business owners for it, but um, a lot of the work is also done by them in terms of uh, uh, library updates and things like that. So it's it's a continuous, um, you know, partnership that uh, we made sure that it's actually documented and we got buy-in from QA teams. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm seeing another question that might relate uh, directly to your topic area, Eric. Um, I'll read it out just so it's on the call. And then uh, if you don't mind answering, um, the question reads, high test coverage indicates that most lines in the code base have been run through tests, but this may not necessarily be indicative of the quality of the tests. How do people address this problem? A great question. I We don't have a way to address this. I mean, at some point we have to um, assume best intentions, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to think that our package developers are not malicious people because like that seems like an interesting use of your time if that were the case um but certainly a, a real concern and I, we'd welcome you know um ideas on how to maybe get at this i i've always wondered if if there was a way to measure sort of multiplicity of testing lines. So do you test it once? Do you maybe test it? And that might indicate sort of the thoroughness of your thought process. Do you, you know, you could test to make sure your output is a number, but do you also test for errors when, you know, something else comes out or something goes in and, and maybe that's a way to sort of get at that um, intention and quality of test. Um, but I, I don't think we have a good answer at this point. If I yeah. remember though, there was, um, I remember there were like one or two companies who actually went and had, under some circumstances, they would end up in the, and actually review uh, the test code. Um, I I would need to go back who exactly that was and say, et cetera, et cetera, or everyone could go back and check that out in GitHub and uh, recording, obviously. Um, but uh, it's, it's really it's a it's a concern that was brought up I think in every company and uh, some there 
you know, we are not only, we have to at some point quantify and put numbers on things and say like, this is a number that we built Com uh, as a composite of different elements, right? And the test coverage is one thing, and then there are multiple other things that like check if there's like good software development practices. And um, at some point we gotta drill it down to one number and say like, okay, yes or no. And, um, or yes, no, maybe in some cases. And um, uh, this is just the nature of it. And uh, also I wanna keep in mind that, you know, validate, that's why we kind of moved away from validation, even though it's still the name of the R validation hub and actually went for risk assessment because we can just do so much in uh, mitigating the risk that we are taking by using certain software. And by the end of the day, we also, and that's also a requirement by the FDA beyond testing our, making sure we're documenting the quality of our software is we also have to document that the people who are executing the software are, are having the appropriate um, education. And um, therefore we have a whole process that is required by FDA. So the risk assessment of the software is just one piece. I want to keep, keep that in mind as well. Yeah, I just want to chime in also that, you know, this question has been flipped on its head and uh, questions raised that uh, say a package that says low test coverage, is that uh, not a good package to be included? You know, so that's something that we have also tried to address as, as Julianne was mentioning and Eric was mentioning that test coverage is just one part of the metrics that when we are doing the evaluation for the risk assessment. So it's just, um, it's not necessarily the major part. It just plays a part in identifying that. And as, as, as Julianne mentioned, the reviewers also uh, play an important part. So, you know, completely automating it would not actually be a good path, at least at least uh, Mark philosophy right now is that we need to have some human element so that we can, you know, look at these fringe cases, also look at some issues that would pop up when you're doing a full automation. Maybe just to make sure that we hit all the topics before we hit the hour. Um, I'll, I'll continue with the second, what would be, would have been a breakout room. So, one of the follow on topics to um, what Julianne had mentioned is that there's a big amount of overhead that goes into each company kind of investing in this effort initially. And one of the long standing goals within the Art Validation Hub has been to provide resources so that this is a collective effort, so that this isn't something where we just provide guidance and there's an overwhelming amount of activity that uh, each institution has to do independently in order to allow for people to do analysis in R. And so part of that initiative is how do we provide packages to people in a way that's kind of communal? Um, and, you know, in the R world, we have resources that already kind of satisfy, satisfy these goals. Um, we have CRAN and Bioconductor. Um, we have R Universe. Um, we have, you know, if you want to go with a, um, a, a, a product, you can use like um, a positive package manager, you know, to manage this stuff even in the public sphere. Um, and we're thinking now, how do we take one of those products or build something ourselves that satisfies all these different needs that we might have from, um, uh, from a validation perspective? Um, or whether we need to go in that direction at all is also you know, totally an open question. Some of the considerations that we have around this topic are, um, what are the things that give us confidence or concerns when using a package? And can we surface those things so that they're made more visible when you, when you go to choose a package? Um, could a package repository or a service or a you know off-the-shelf solution that's public um, offer this information more transparently? Um, how do we improve the reproducibility of polling packages? So you know on CRAN, you know packages can be archived. You know that's uh, an issue that we have to address. And if you go and try to install that package, you know you're going to be hit with a package unavailable message. So the reproducibility is a little bit sacrificed, but with this in the spirit of making sure that all the packages available are always of high quality. Um, in an industry where reproducibility is really critical, you know that poses some challenges. So is the, are there improvements that we can make there to help make sure that we can continue to provide reproducible analytics, especially for um, you know high uh, high importance deliverables. Um, can we, if, if we have varying levels of quality, you know, that's an open question for us too. Um, you know, sometimes you have a high profile phase three study, or sometimes you have some exploratory analysis. You still probably want them both to be reproducible if they're gonna be used for really like meaningful decision-making to your development process. 
but they might have different tolerances for the quality of code that you want to make sure you're using. So how do we, is that something we need to bake into the, the process? Um, and then thinking about this, this kind of important information, let's say that we discover that someone has 100% test coverage, but they're all kind of these spurious tests that, uh, you know, are kind of a false positive. Um, is that something that we want to be able to flag? So is there like a community engagement part where we want to leverage the fact that we have, you know, thousands of eyes on these packages and we want to be able to assess the, the collective we want to collectively be able to assess the quality and maybe share those findings with one another. So is there a community aspect that we want to be able to roll into this? So those are all open questions that we have um, in terms of what is what does an ideal product look like in terms of how we jointly de deliver packages. Um, and if you have questions or suggestions or other thoughts on that topic, uh, I'd love to hear them. So feel free to drop those in the Q&A. Um, otherwise, um, I can hand it over to Julianne to introduce um, the test data and cases. Yeah, uh, Colleen also put into the chat the uh, uh, repo working group. So that's obviously also a really good place. Um, if, yeah. uh, if 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 this is not a good a good time for you to speak up and have to think about it a little bit, like this is the place to go. Um, and uh, these uh, our, our breakout rooms have been also like set up in this kind of perspective because we do not only want to discuss it and then like you know, okay, now we are done going home. It's time for lunch kind of thing. Um, we actually want to like continue working on this. Um, so. Um, another piece that is kind of right now a little bit the question whether it should be part of the repo working group or not is the sharing test data and test cases, because um, as pointed out, like the test coverage is crucial for so many for so many assessments, um, and uh, the quality of the test cases might not be good enough, uh, whatever defines good or not good in this place, right? But um, having um, output sharing, like I think a lot of companies do use the CDIS data, for instance, um, and it seems like we all independently reproduce some set of test cases using the CDIS data. So um, why are we doing this? Why aren't we producing this once and instead of everyone using the same uh, CDIS data, another company could use a different data set. Let's say we use some statistical uh, standard statistical literature where we have the output and the calculation um, with, a, with R or with another software and we can, we can prove the reproducibility um, and make sure that whatever version the package comes, it's always the same number that's going to be the hazard ratio when you compare the survival. Um, so um, having said that, like having those standard data sets and building the test cases and uh, good literature that is peer reviewed uh, is like something that we may all do internally in the company and it was, would be worth sharing because it's just creating a lot of overhead, a lot of work. And um, the question would be here, like, what are the test data sources that you're using? Do you have test cases? And is that something that should be introduced actually into the repository? Or is it something that we could kind of, as a collective, try to um, channel away, uh, channel back to the package maintainers so they actually become test cases. So the next time they immediately get integrated and uh, we do not have to externally run them anyways. So yeah, if you have any uh, good ideas for this, um, this is a good time to speak um, or bring it up later. Um, I, I'm not seeing new questions, but yes, as Julian said, please throw them in. I'll, I'll ask a question. So one of the resources that's I, I think really cool in this space is um, our open size um, statistical review rocklets, which is kind of an annotation scheme that implements their statistical review guidelines and allows you to kind of like annotate that as part of your documentation. And um, I was kind of curious if anyone on the call has ex has experience working with those and what their experience has been, because I think that could be a really cool way of starting to annotate um, you know, these types of test cases. And then that gives us an, a mechanism to introduce tests or documenting, um, you know, standard data sets that we've used and uh, implemented using packages um, and contribute that back into kind of the repository itself. So 
really interested to see how that continues to grow if anyone's used it before. I can say not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, last time I checked in on it, it was still in, in development, but um, I haven't in a couple of years now. So I'm I'm really intrigued to see if it's, you know, started to grow some legs and be put into action. I think it might be time for us also to revisit that. So um, yeah, uh, interested if any of anyone on the call happens to have experience with it. But as there's no other questions trickling in, maybe I can pass it off then to Preetham to introduce our last topic. Thank you, Doug. Again, um, this uh, topic is about our package reviewers, and it's, it's it's a recurring theme and one of the challenges that each of our organizations has been facing. Um, as we know, we saw from Julian Stock, you know, uh, reviewing the packages for their accuracy or even their risk levels is something that uh, has to be done in order to be operating in a qualified uh, environment. And um, it's one of the things that uh, the QA teams are particularly interested about and uh, is something that uh, they keep uh, bringing up in all of our discussions. Now, uh, with respect to the package review, Reviewers, um, the main important thing is the qualification of the reviewers, as Julian has men uh, mentioned, and which we are probably all aware of. Uh, you know, on an yearly basis, we are all of our organizations probably collect our resumes, updated resumes to be made sure that they are stored because we are operating in a regulated environment, and that's one of the. Um, things that uh, the regulatory authorities would probably need when they're auditing. So in terms of qualification of reviewers, that's something that uh, we are also trying to <coughs> make sure that we have some sort of um, uh, document or um, we have documented what kind of uh, qualifications they possess. So it's not just about the education, it's also about they've used that package that they're reviewing before or if they have experience uh, with respect to that package. That's some of the questions that have been raised and that we're trying to answer as well. Now, as uh, Julian and others mentioned also is that um, just because you're a reviewer of an R package does not mean you're not uh, you're qualified to review every single package. So it could be that you're not qualified or ex uh, equipped to actually review packages that are of highly statistical uh, complex modeling. And that would be probably require a um, few more statistical help. So maybe, uh, you know, a package that is highly uh, statistical nature should be reviewed by more statisticians and also um, lesser um, you know, more um, less uh, uh, packages that involve less uh, of uh, statistical modeling, more of uh, utilities, maybe could be uh, reviewed by a, a reviewer who's more um, qualified to review them. So that's some type of, um, you know, uh, um, package versus reviewer questions that we have also uh, been raised in our organization and others as well. Um, another topic is also that about standard workflow or guidance or procedures. I don't think there is any literature out there that actually guides us as we do for the actual qualification now that uh, we have started do the, doing these package qualifications and validations for open software. There's a lot of uh, literature coming out regarding that, but with respect to specifics about the reviews themselves, there's very very little guidance. Um, and so, you know, that is another area of topic uh, that we are trying to see if we can um, look at uh, some guidances. But uh, at this point, we might have to actually do another white paper, Doug, <laughs> regarding this particular topic. Um, and um, this brings us to the actual question is what kind of a documentation, you know, we would need and things like that when we are actually uh, doing the, uh, uh, we are asking the reviewers to review a package for the qualification purposes. And, you know, uh, we have a uh, checklists, you know, some organizations might employ checklists about what, what needs to be done, what needs to be checked with respect to the packages. It could be um, the metrics from the risk metric app, or, you know, it could be some other in-house uh, qualification app that's generating metrics. They might review that, or they might go to the source of the package themselves and check out what, uh, what the different uh, changes have been over the years and things like that. Also, you know, some basic questionnaires uh, with respect to what the package is doing. So, for example, is that, uh, you know, uh, package, um, you know, uh, the results from the package, are they reproducible, especially if it's uh, using some sort of um, random number generator or, uh, you know, things like that, or, um, you know, is there, um, uh, is there some other imports that pack that package is using and is that 
import, um, uh, you know, qualified to be actually uh, useful, useful for our, our purposes. And also, you know, is there any peer review publications that these packages have been, um, uh, you know, um, demonstrated in? So that's something that uh, is also in, uh, useful. So a questionnaire for the reviewers as well to answer and guide them. Um, and also another important part is the timing or the frequency of this review. So um, the packages, as we all know, could be updated, um, you know, um, sometimes in a, within a month or so. And so would you actually approach your reviewers each time they're, review, uh, they're updated and ask them to re-review them? And if they do, are they focusing on the, just the changes themselves? Are they actually focusing on the entire package again? And so these are the questions that we are trying to answer as part of a reviewer. And, you know, um, that's something that would be really helpful for all the organizations. So, you know, if you had some, you know, some ideas, some questions about this, you know, this, this would be a really wonderful um, forum to start uh, working on the, I mean, uh, asking these and maybe we can get answers together. I'm also realizing that we are almost, we are at the hour. Yes. Um, so yeah, these conversations are always very interesting and we are running way too fast out of time. But um, it doesn't mean that we are tabling it and are not coming back. We really encourage people to uh, join the all hands meetings that we are trying to uh, make happen uh, more frequently and uh, yes we are always we are doing this in our free time so we are we are we are always promising to get better um, but we already have like uh, some plan for this year so please uh, sign up for the our validation hub mailing list to stay in touch with these and um, we will have all hands meetings coming up uh, over the course of the year and I'm very sure that uh, at least two or three topics from that list will be extensively discussed um, in those uh, all hands meetings amazing um thank you so much for your questions and we really appreciate uh you for taking the time to tune in to your curiosity on our validation uh, i've also posted a link to the webinar recording in case you uh you missed parts of it and you came in later or if any of your colleagues want to watch it it's on the R consortium website under webinars uh you can also see the old uh the past webinars there as well uh thank you julianne doug pritam and eric um your passion shows and i loved getting an insight into the work you all do so appreciate it thank you Maya and Agita for organizing this thank you yeah thanks everyone and thanks for being flexible as we had to make some uh coordination changes um with how things ran so thank you everyone for your willingness to float with that thank you thank you bye bye Take care. have a good rest of your day you too